In this video, what I want to do is I want to combine the knowledge that we got in the previous video where we learned what the graph of sine and cosine look like. Pictured in green is y equals the sine of x and pictured in red is y equals the cosine of x. I want to combine that knowledge with something that maybe you learned in a previous math class and maybe a math 111 class where we learn about function transformations. And for most students, function transformations is one of the more challenging things they learn in a previous math class. What I want you to be able to do by the end of this section is be able to graph functions that look like this. So this is the graph of y equals sine of x, except it's transformed. There's a number in place of a, b, c, and d. And each of those numbers change the graph of y equals sine of x. And what I want you to understand is how they change the graph. And if you understand how each of those different numbers change the graph, maybe you'd be able to graph this thing, or similarly this thing, which has the same function transformations. The only difference is we're starting with the cosine graph instead of the sine graph. And for a lot of students, that's really, really challenging. Function transformations are really hard. But the good news is when you're transforming sine and cosine, there's some tricks you can do to understand what each of the different letters does to the graph. And if you understand those tricks, it makes it a lot easier than just applying all the knowledge that you might have of function transformations. Maybe we can learn this via an example. Suppose you were asked to sketch the graph of y equals 2 times the cosine of x minus 3. Note that that is following this format, except in place of an a is the number 2. And in place of a D is the number negative three. The B is just a one and the C is just a zero. So we can ignore those. We're not transforming the X value at all. We're just having A and a D that are relevant in this problem. What I think would help if you were trying to sketch this is having in mind what the graph of Y equals cosine of X looks like. And if you already have an idea of that, that's ideal. But in case you don't, here is the graph of Y equals cosine of X. I think that even though this graph continues forever, both to the right and the left, it's easier to focus on one revolution of the graph so I'm drawing that in solid here, and then the dotted lines just kind of give you an idea of how the graph continues. Remember, y equals cosine of x, informally speaking, starts out up at the top here at 1 and starts out by going down, does one full revolution in a distance of 2 pi. Also, this graph never gets above positive 1, nor does it ever get below negative 1. And there's some kind of nice symmetry going on at 0 here. 0 is sort of the middle of this graph in the vertical direction. Maybe having these dashed red lines helps to see all that. And even if you don't need those facts to sketch a graph of y equals cosine of x, I think those facts will really help you when you're trying to sketch the graph of y equals 2 times the cosine of x minus 3. Because all this 2 and this negative 3 are going to do to this graph is affect these dashed lines. This negative 3 is going to shift this midline down 3 units. So instead of being at y equals 0 here, it's going to be at y equals negative 3 down here. And then what this 2 is going to do is it's going to stretch my graph vertically by a factor of 2. So instead of this graph oscillating between positive 1 and negative 1, it's going to get twice as high and twice as low. But not from this midline at 0, but from this midline at negative 3. What I'm saying is from this midline at negative 3, my graph is going to get 2 units higher than that and 2 units lower than that. The way I think about it is this negative 3 is telling me to put my midline right here. And then this positive 2 is telling me that the distance from my midline to the top or the distance from my midline to the bottom is equal to 2. And you're like, wow, that's a lot of work. There's a lot of crazy arrows going on here, and you haven't even sketched the graph. True, but from here, it's really easy to sketch the graph. All I got to do is draw something that has the same shape as this graph in red, except instead of using the red dashed lines for the top and the bottom and the middle of the graph, I want to use the blue dashed lines for the top and the bottom and the middle of the graph. So when I'm sketching cosine, remember it starts out, informally speaking, at the top. The top of the blue range would be right here. The lowest it ever gets down here at negative 1 happens at a distance of pi. So my blue graph should be at its lowest point at pi, which is down here. After a distance of 2 pi, it's done a full revolution. It's back all the way up to the top. If you want to be a little more precise, you can note that at pi over 2 and at 3 pi over 2, this graph is right on the midline. It has a height of 0 here. So what that means is my graph in blue at pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2 should be right on its midline, which instead of being at 0 is at negative 3. With these dots, I have enough information that I can try my best to sketch a graph of the equation given in blue. There's one full revolution. Really, it continues in both directions. But once you have one full revolution, you kind of have all the information in there encoded that you need. What I'm saying is if you can understand this 2 and this negative 3 as just changing the dashed lines that sort of bound my curves, we're halfway there. Because really, we only have to understand four letters, and we've kind of just summarized two of them. Some vocabulary terms to summarize what we've just said is the number that you have in place of D here just tells you where the middle of your graph should go. 
The middle of your graph is what's called the midline. D will always just tell you what your midline is. A, on the other hand, this two, tells you how much higher you get from your midline or equivalently how much lower you get from your midline when your graph is reaching its maximum and minimum values. There's a fancy name for that as well. It's what's called the amplitude. And you're like, oh, okay, A is the amplitude? Almost. The absolute value of A is the amplitude. And the reason we need absolute value symbols here is because the amplitude is defined to be how far it is from the middle of the graph to the highest it ever gets or the lowest it ever gets. And when we're talking about distance like that, it only makes sense to have positive numbers. But that begs the question, what would the graph of negative two times the cosine of X minus three look like? Well, if you were given this information, you'd say D equals negative three, so my midline is still at negative three, so that's this blue dashed line right here. And then A is negative two, but the absolute value of negative two is positive two, so my amplitude is positive two, so I draw this dashed blue line two above my midline, and this dashed blue line two below my midline. So I still wanna draw a graph that goes in between these two dashed blue lines with this as its middle. You're like, wait, isn't that the exact same as this? Almost, the negative here is gonna flip the orientation. What do I mean by that? If you think about the cosine graph, it normally starts out, and when I say starts out, there should be big air quotes around that, up at the top at its maximum value. But what a negative does in terms of function transformations is it reflects the graph vertically. So what that ends up doing is it moves this point from the maximum it ever achieves to the minimum it ever achieves. What I'm saying is if you're trying to sketch the graph of negative two cosine of X minus three, put your dotted lines in the same spot, but instead of starting up at the top here, start down at the bottom. All the maximums switch to minimums and all the minimums switch to maximums. The points on the midline stay at the midline. It's just the orientation of the graph flips. Probably a bad idea to use the same color, so I try to make one a little bit darker. The graph of y equals negative two cosine of x minus three. It's just this graph that you see in blue here that's not as thick as the graph that you see in dark blue here. Let's try one more example. What if we needed to sketch the graph of y equals two sine of x plus one? Well, you'd look at this and recognize that d equals one, so my midline is gonna be at one here, and my amplitude is two, because the absolute value of two is two, so from this midline, I wanna go up two units and down two units. Note that two units above one is at three, and two units below one is at negative one. These dashed lines give me kind of the guidelines on which I'm gonna sketch my graph. And you're like, wait, do you start from the top or the bottom? I didn't quite get that. Well, neither, because this is a transformation of the sine graph, and the sine graph, starts out in the middle and heads upward. That'll probably be useful to reference, so I'm gonna sketch it up here in green. Y equals sine of X looks like this. Starts in the middle and then heads up, back to the middle, down, back to the middle. Two pi is how long it takes to make one full revolution. I wanna sketch that same thing, except instead of this being the middle, I wanna think about this as the middle. It starts out by going up, it reaches its maximum value at pi over two. By the time it gets to pi, it's back down to the midline. Right, starts out in the middle, by the time it gets a distance of pi, we're back to the midline. Then it goes down, it reaches its minimum value at three pi over two, and by the time we get back to two pi, we're back to the midline. What I'm saying is the graph of y equals two sine of x plus one should go through these points, and loosely speaking, it would look like this. And maybe you can contrast that with the graph of y equals negative two times the sine of x plus one. Midline still at one, that's this dotted line. The amplitude is the absolute value of negative two, which is two. So from this one, I wanna go up two to get to this three or down two to get to this negative one. It looks like my dashed green lines are gonna be the exact same for the red graph as they were for the green graph. But the difference is this negative is gonna flip my orientation. What that meant for the cosine graph was instead of starting at the top, I'm gonna to start at the bottom. What that means for the sine graph is I'm still gonna start in the middle, but instead of starting out by heading up, I'm gonna start out by heading down. This maximum value will correspond with this minimum value. This minimum value will correspond with this maximum value. All the points on the midline are gonna remain exactly where they were. My graph of y equals negative two sine of x plus one would go through these red dots and loosely speaking look like this. That's it, all you need to know when you're sketching these graphs and the only values you're concerned with are their values of A and D is take the value of D and make that your midline and then from that midline go up and down by whatever the amplitude is. Remember the amplitude is the absolute value of A. That gives you the dashed lines. Once you have the dashed lines, you're in pretty good shape. All you gotta do is think about whether what you're sketching is a transformation of the cosine graph or the sine graph. And if it's a transformation of the cosine graph, think, Cosine should start out up at the top here, and if it's a transformation of the sine graph, think it should start in the middle here and head up. 
And that's all true unless your value of A is negative. Because if your value of A is negative, well, that won't affect the amplitude. It does affect the orientation. It flips all the minimums into maximums and all the maximums into minimums. Another way you can think about that is if you're sketching a graph of cosine and your value of A is negative, instead of starting out at the top here, like we did in blue, start out down at the bottom. If you're sketching a transformation of the sine graph and your value of A is negative, we're still starting in the middle, but instead of heading up, we head down because this maximum switches to this minimum. Note that everything we've done so far is just move the graphs up and down. They've all been vertical transformations. A and D are vertical transformations. B and C are what are called horizontal transformations. And once you wrap your head around A and D, you're ready to talk about B and C. However, I think that that's probably best served in the next video.